Bibles, let's go to Colossians chapter 1 this morning. All hail King Jesus. You know, last, last week in the first chapter of Colossians, we met King Jesus, remember? Well, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The creator and the sustainer of all things. The head of his body, the church. No longer the suffering servant, but now and forevermore, the King of Kings. Our, our author, the Apostle Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, now turns his attention to the church. In light of what we've just heard, Jesus is King. What now? And I love what he does with this, these next few verses. Because he, he moves from the throne room, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he brings his focus down to a very personal picture of every true follower of that king. This morning, I really have two separate messages that God has placed on my heart. But they're both going to come from this one passage, these few verses. For there is a, a message here for true believers, those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a message of encouragement. I hope that you are encouraged to know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, for I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. I hope that you have come to the place in your walk before the Lord to when you do get discouraged. And I know discouragement comes when you do get frustrated, when you get stressed and anxious and overwhelmed that you have learned to go to that place of remembrance where you come before the Lord and remember what He has done for you. Boy, there's encouragement there. And so to the believer, I pray that these words would be words of encouragement and support. But there's also a, a message here to the unbelievers. We call that message the gospel. It is a message of truth. It is a message of hope. God wants you to know this morning as you see others around you celebrating King Jesus with a joy that is inexpressible that you too can have that joy. That you too can have that testimony that you too can have a life that has been transformed by the power of God in Jesus Christ. Oh, it's the same message. But for some, it is a word of encouragement. For others, it is a great word of challenge. It is a word of hope that says, you too can experience these truths. So let's go to the passage in Colossians chapter 1. And I've entitled this message, Salvation's Plan. I just finished about uh, seven or eight months preaching out of the book of Romans. You may remember that little book that we waded through uh, beginning in January and just finished a few weeks ago. And it was, I was delighted this week as I was reading just these few verses, uh, Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And the thought just hit me, this is, this is Romans in a nutshell. It's the same author, you know, Paul wrote the book of Romans, but he came, came back and wrote to the, the church in Colossae and he had some things to do and, and he gave, gave to them the condensed version of salvation. And here's what he says. Let's look at verse 1, um, excuse me, verse 21, because here we're going to see he defines very clearly our need or the necessity of salvation. And his point is simply stated that everyone needs to be saved. That without Jesus Christ, we have no hope. It is a passage that Bronson referred us to just a moment ago from the book of Romans. That all sin and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin 
is death. Now, here's how he says it to the church at Colossae. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. What, what a description. What a description. Now, what we need to remember this morning is that the Apostle Paul had never been to Colossae. Keep that in mind. And that tells me that he didn't know these people. He certainly didn't know them personally. I'm sure he had heard some reports about how the church was going. But this sounds like someone who is saying, you are a bunch of evil people. Your minds were corrupt. Your hearts were no good. It sounds like quite a bit of judgment, a harsh judgment, harsh criticism, until we realize that Paul didn't know them. So what he's doing here in this verse is he's reminding them of something that we refer to in theology class as the depravity of man. He's not just talking about the Colossians before they came to Christ. He's talking about everybody. He's remembering what he wrote into the book to, to the church at Rome. All sin and fall short of glory of the glory of God. And because of that sin, we were alienated. Look at that word. Alienated means that we were separated from. We were taken away. That one word is a very powerful word in theology, and it takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see this thing referred to as the fall of man, when, when man sinned against God, rebelled against God. And there's a tragedy that happens in the last couple of verses of chapter 3. For there it says that God drove them from the garden. God drove them from his presence. Before that time, in creation, we see that there was supposed to be this fellowship and relationship between God Almighty and his creation. And and the Bible teaches us that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Adam, how was your day? Oh, it's pretty good. Just had a great conversation with God. Went real well. We see the sweetness and the intimacy of that relationship until sin came. And because of sin, we were separated, alienated from God. And he points that out. And because of man's alienation from God, our only option when discerning how to live had to come out of our hearts. How to come out of our own will. Our own desires, because after all, we have been separated from our God. In the book of Jeremiah, it says, the heart of man is dark, deceitful, evil. Who can know it? Who can fathom the heart of man? We talk about that as being the depravity of man, that there is a gap between us and our maker, and there's nothing that we can do to fix that. There's nothing that we can do to bridge that gap, no matter how hard we try, because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So all Paul is doing here is he's just stating the obvious. He says, look, I didn't meet you folks. I don't know you personally, but I do know this. Before you came to know Christ, you were alienated from God. You were alienated from this king we just talked about. You had no access. And so clearly... He points to that need of salvation. Message number one to those of you who are saved. How long has it been since you sat down and you realized what Jesus did for you at that cross we sang about a while ago? How long have you thought about what life was before coming to know him? How long has it been since you recognized the fact that Jesus bridged a gap that we could not bridge? He did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. Have you rejoiced at the foot of the cross? Realizing that in that moment, something was being done for you. That gave you every opportunity to once again restore that relationship with Almighty God. 
And for those of you who are not believers, or maybe you're unsure, I hope that you have seen a little bit of yourself in this passage. And you've realized very honestly that that describes your life beautifully. This feeling of being alienated from God. You may have some form of religion. You may be in church Sunday after Sunday. You may listen to Christian music. You may read your Bible on occasions. You may pray on occasions. But you know deep down in your heart that there is no true connection between you and God. And you still feel separated from Him. That is the condition of the unrighteous. That is the result of sin that has been unresolved. Alienation from God. But then we look at verse 22. For he moves there from the necessity of our salvation to the plan of that salvation. Boy, chapter, uh, verse 22 is absolutely packed full of some good stuff. And he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. Uh, what was the first problem of the unbeliever that he mentioned in, ver in the verse 21? Alienation, separation. So, so, so now what's the plan? The plan is to reconcile. Well, let's just start with that. The whole gospel is the good news that it is God's desire to reconcile unto himself those who have been alienated because of sin. This is where this is going. This is the plan. The plan is we have people who once were alienated or who are separated because of sin and we could not do anything about that. So God passionately began to pursue the alienated so that he could reconcile them back to himself. That's good news, isn't it? And, and it tells us how he did that. In his body of flesh by his death. Now, we get a lot of theology in those few words as well. You see, in his body of flesh refers to what we call the incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. God became flesh. Philippians chapter 2 says, Though he was... God Almighty, he was willing to humble himself and take the form of a servant, even of a man. So that in his flesh, he could do something that would serve as a necessary offering to reconcile sinful humanity with a holy God. What was that something? It says right here. By his death. That's right. You know, you bring any child that's been brought up in the church, Christian church, six years old, seven year old, eight year old, and you ask them this question Well, what did Jesus do for you? 99% of the time, they're going to say, He died on the cross for my sin. Hallelujah. They are exactly right. That may sound like a childish, childlike answer, and it may well be, and there's a lot more to it than that, but that's a great place to start the conversation. In his flesh, he died. You see, we, we, we read on in this passage, and it says, in order to present you, present you to who? To the Father. Right, we've been alienated. So I love, I love his, his practicality here. He says, so, so get this. He said, Jesus became a man. He came down to be with us. Those of us who are alienated. So he crossed the gap. And his plan was, now what I want to do is I want to make a way so that I can take you back with me and present you to the Father, not as sinful, broken, alienated humanity, but what does he say? As blameless, holy, and above reproach before him. Wow. 
Well, that's a lot. So, so how does that work? How does that work? How could Jesus do such a thing? How could he come and find a humanity that was alienated, a humanity that was sinful, a humanity that was, that was, that was condemned for all eternity because sin, the wages of sin is death? How could he rescue so many? Well, Romans chapter 5, he said it this way. God demonstrated his own love for us like this. While we were still sinners. Alienated. Broken. Condemned. While we were sinners. Jesus died for us. Christian, wrap your heart around that this morning if you haven't done so in a while. There's a message there for you. He died for you. You want to be encouraged today? Remember that last week we met King Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. And this week we're being reminded that he died for you. You. It's good news. Look over in Colossians chapter 2 because he explains it a little more fully here. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. He says these words. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. Well, how could he do that? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Hmm. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. One of the Roman cultural traditions that accompanied crucifixion was when a person was being crucified, oftentimes they did not die immediately. They could be hanging on the cross for days at a time before they would die. And then sometimes, even after death, they would allow the bodies to hang there as a public example. And in order to make them a public example, it was customary that they would make a sign depicting the sin, the crime that this person had committed in order to deserve crucifixion. So the sign would say, murderer, rapist, thief so the crime that they were convicted of would be placed there and that way when people would walk by they would see those signs and then they would see the graphic punishment for committing those crimes and it would be quite a deterrent as you might imagine Paul is picking up on that thought as he's writing to the church at Colossae And he says, when Jesus hanged on that cross, oh, you might not have could have seen a sign literally, but spiritually, God placed a sign there. And it had our sins on it. Think about that. Page after page after page after page after page after page. The sins of humanity. It's what it says. He set it aside by nailing it to his cross. You see, I want you, to, I want you to understand that we find forgiveness of sin not because our sins are ignored, but because our sins have been punished. And the wrath of God has been satisfied through his son, the perfect spotless lamb who knew no sin. 
You have to understand, when, uh, when in theology, we talk about this, this concept of Christology, that, it, that he is fully God and fully man, but he also lived a perfect life. Do you know why he, it was necessary for him to be tempted but sin not? Do you know why that sin not is so important? Because had he committed only one, then he would have hanged on that cross that day for his sin. But because he was the perfect spotless lamb, it qualified him to be there for mine and for yours and for all of ours. So message number one is for those who are true believers and true followers of Jesus. I hope that you will leave this place today with a testimony of praise and thanksgiving. Because Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Look at verse 23, because he kind of finishes this beautiful little snapshot of theology in this next verse. Because here he talks about the evidence of salvation. How do you know? How do you know? Maybe when I first started the message a while ago, you were one of those that, that was somewhere in the middle. I said, this is for the believers and another message for the unbelievers. And you were thinking, well, what if I'm not sure? There's a lot of folks that have that testimony. I'm just not real sure. So he gives evidence here. And let's look at this evidence. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So here's what he's saying. Okay, this, this is for all of you if, that's a big word, isn't it? Two letters, but a lot of word. If you indeed continue in the faith. Okay, so here, here's the question. And I want to deal with that for just a couple minutes. Can a true believer fall from grace? Now that's a question that theologians have been, have been knocking around for a long time. And there are different views and different opinions about that. So we want to see what does the word say to us. It certainly alludes to the fact that it's, it's possible. Because why would he say if, if it were not at all possible? And who's he talking about specifically there? Well, let's take a look. Well, we can, we can look at some of our historical teachers here. Uh, a, a moment ago, Bronson mentioned the Reformation and the Reformers and Reformed theology. People like John Calvin and others would argue and they would say, no, a true believer cannot lose their salvation. They cannot fall from grace. They, they believe in this thing called the perseverance of saints and that the elect are elected by God. And once God elects you, you are in forever and ever. Amen. And there's really nothing that you can do about that. A little bit later on, the, the, um, the, the Anabaptist began to talk a lot about this thing we call once saved, always saved. Have you heard that? Once saved, always saved. And we give the, we, we talk there about this authentic conversion experience. And once you have that, then you will always be a believer. You'll always be a child of God. I, I've, re I've reminded you many times from this pulpit what Dr. Hendricks used to say in theology class when talking about the doctrine of perseverance. He would say, as Baptists, we often get the emphasis on the wrong syllable which means we put the emphasis on the once and always and not so much on the saved. And then we can, we can turn and talk to our free will friends, our free will Baptist and Pentecostal brothers and, and those folks, and they would say, absolutely, you can lose your salvation and you have to come find it again. If you have a will to get in, you certainly have a will to get out. And that's their discussion as well. And so we have to think about this and we have to look and we, we want to find out from Scripture what is the case. Now listen, let me tell you what I believe Scripture teaches. I believe that perseverance itself, being faithful to the end, is evidence of authentic salvation. Okay. That's, that, that's what I believe the Bible teaches. Let me show you why I believe it teaches that. Let's look at some Scripture. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. I know this is a great, this is a question that many of you are dealing with right now, particularly when you deal with family and friends and others. And let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and following. 
It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, he's talking about Jesus, when you heard the truth about Jesus, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. Okay, so now, he starts with saying, when you heard and believed. So let's just, let's just call that the moment of true conversion. You heard the gospel and you believed. For whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Romans says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So belief is important. So here he says, for those who believe, they've heard it, they believe it. Here's what happened. And you believe in him. At that moment, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. What does the word sealed mean? Closed, secured, Right? You you follow me? You were sealed. Your salvation became sealed with the the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Now, according to this passage, if I am truly saved and I have received the seal of the Holy Spirit, my security is the responsibility of whom? The Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God comes into me and not only transports me in from darkness to life, being the active agent of my salvation in the first place, but the Holy Spirit also stays with me, assuring that I will persevere, giving me the ability, giving me the urgency, giving me the um, accountability to stay true To what I have professed, because he is now that um, inherit, he is that um, guarantee of my inheritance. I want you to look at another passage, 2 Timothy. Paul is writing to the younger Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and look at verse 12. It says, Which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. There's that word again. So we're talking to true believers. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. I am assured that God is able to keep me until that day. Again, it is no longer my responsibility It is the Lord's responsibility to protect and keep me until that day. You see, I believe very much in a free will. But once I choose to surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus and I give it to him, it is no longer mine, but his. And now there is something in my life that supersedes even my own free will. And that is the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit of God who is in me keeping me to that moment. Now listen, I'm going to say something that's very important. This is really on my heart. I want you to hold on to this this morning. There is a difference between someone who has backslidden and someone who has fallen away. I want you to know that. What we typically do is we typically equate anyone who was ever in some religious church or experience or had some maybe baptism experience or something as a child, and they're no longer walking with the Lord at all, we typically want to ease our own conscience toward them and say, well, they're just in a backslidden condition. There's a difference biblically. See, when someone is backslidden, that means their zeal is not what it used to be. That means their passion is not as great as it used to be. They're still in. There is not as much in as they once were. They're not trying as hard anymore. They they still believe there's still something there that's critical to them and important to them. It's just not what it used to be because they kind of dropped the ball in their own personal dedications to the Lord and they've they've fallen back. That's, That's way different than somebody who's gotten out. Somebody that has no desire to follow the Lord, no desire to be in his church, no desire to read his word, no desire to pray, no desire to be among other believers. We can't say of that person that they're in a backslidden condition. 
What the Bible says about them is that they have fallen away and by doing so given evidence that they had no authentic faith to begin with. And so Jesus says very clearly in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do the will of my Father, which means you stay with it to the very end. You see, the Holy Spirit gives evidence. And our perseverance gives evidence that our salvation is authentic. And so I've got two messages to the believer. I hope this has been a time of encouragement for you. I hope you've seen in these few verses that you once were lost, but now you are saved. You once were alienated, but you have been reconciled and reunited with the Father. I hope you've been encouraged as you've thought again about that great plan that in his body of flesh, because of his death, Jesus paid it all and he paid it all for you. And I hope you feel assured this morning that your assurance of salvation is in the fact that you're still trying, that you're still keeping on, that God is still a part of your life and you still have a great desire to follow him and have no intention of backing away for any reason. And you find assurance in that. But for those of you who are not believers, hear the gospel this morning, the good news. You are alienated. But there is hope. Jesus died for you as well. His desire is to present you before the Father as holy and blameless. So that you too can spend an eternity rejoicing with your King. He wants you to know it today. He wants you to be sealed and secured and assured of your salvation today. Thank you for viewing this message from Old Fort Baptist Church. Here at Old Fort, we value biblical truth, missional living, and vital connections. To learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit us online at oldfortbaptist.org. To help support the ongoing ministry of the church, you can give at oldfortbaptist.org give. Thank you, and God bless.